Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Krangel, the support group facilitator for Northern California. And I started the support group program for MDS several years ago when I was the outreach director. But I am here to introduce our speaker. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lori Gutman, who will be talking with us today about DM symptom management and treatment options. Dr. Gutman is professor and chair of neurology at Indiana University beginning October 1st, very soon, next week, and is a neuromuscular specialist with clinical and research focus in myotonic dystrophy. She will co-direct the Indiana University Neuroscience Institute and previously she developed the Myotonic Dystrophy Multidisciplinary Clinic at the University of Iowa, where she was the Vice Chair of Clinical Research. She is the co-chair of the NIH Neuromuscular Disorders Common Data Elements Committee and co-leads the NIH Clinical Trials Methodology course. Dr. Gutman serves on several National committees focused on education and training of medical specialists, as well as previously serving as the MDA clinic director and chair of the Neurology Review Committee for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. She graduated from Oberlin College, received her MD from West Virginia University and did residency and fellowship training at the University of Virginia. She has been caring for patients with neuromuscular disorders for over 30 years and I'm pleased to hand it over to Dr. Gutman. Thank you very much, Leslie. I appreciate the introduction. I'm really honored to be uh, asked to speak to you all today and um, hopefully can handle the technology <laughs> okay. Um, I really want to also thank uh, Dyne Therapeutics for sponsoring this session. And I would like to just emphasize that this community is very important to me, um, as well as this organization. I feel like it's a unique organization because of the communication that happens between you um, and your families, your, and as well as all the clinicians and researchers who are in, involved. And it's very inspiring to work with you all. I moved to Indiana recently, and uh, as the head of the Department of Neurology, one of my goals is to, uh, to build a multidisciplinary myotonic dystrophy clinic similar to the one we built at the University of Iowa. So I'm going to start my talk, if I share my screen appropriately. So um, I was given the uh, task of putting together a talk on symptom management and treatment options for myotonic dystrophy. And, and there we go. All right. So, I hope before I start out, I wanted to just remind you that it, management of symptoms and treatment is a multidisciplinary approach for this disease. And uh, to care for uh, people with myotonic dystrophy, you have to be a part of the care team. And I hope that you realize that your voice is important, that physicians learn from you, and that every person's management and treatment can be very different. Um, if you didn't see Dr. Erica Green's talk earlier today, hopefully you will get to see it on the website and uh, stay tuned for Dr. Jacinda Sampton, Sampson's uh, talk that will follow tomorrow, I believe. So the outline for my talk is pretty simple. simple. I'm going to talk about what kind of symptoms we see in myotonic dystrophy. I'm going to talk about the management versus treatment. What does that mean? And then we'll... the the bulk of the talk is on different options for management and treatment. So starting out, symptoms in myotonic dystrophy. So it's a multi-system disease, as all, all of you know. And if you don't know, you, you've, you 
you've heard about it during this meeting. It can affect your muscles, your heart, your respiratory system, eyes, GI tract, can go on and on. Um, increases your risk for diabetes, thyroid disease, some fertility problems, immune system, bone skin. I can't cover all of the symptoms, but um, we will talk about many of them. And not everyone has symptoms from all these systems. So if you hear this and you say, oh no, now I'm, you know, all these things are gonna be affected in me. No, not, not necessarily, but it's important to know that they could be because when you have symptoms, then we need to look at the different systems that may be involved. And the other thing to remember is that different symptoms may be more of a problem at different times of your life. So you may have more myotonia when you're younger, more weakness when you're older, or you may not have any symptoms until you're older. Uh, and it's important to realize that it's a, a, a bit of a continuum. So these are a lot of the symptoms that people have. Um, remember that some of these, some things that are associated with myotonic dystrophy might not give you symptoms, but they are important to be screened for. So specifically, I'm talking about your heart. So you might have a significant heart rhythm problem and not know it without a yearly EKG. So even though you're not having symptoms, I'm just gonna stress that you need to get your, um, get your yearly EKG. So these are a lot of the symptoms though that people can have. And we'll go through these um, in, to some extent and then hopefully have time for questions at the end. And I'm not separating out um, type one from type two because there may be very similar symptoms. The treatments are very much the same uh, and the symptoms may be to different degrees, but for, um, for purpose of this talk, we're just gonna combine them all. So management versus treatment. What does that mean? Is there a difference? Well, there's, they're slightly different, but there's an overlap. And the definitions, if you look them up on Google or in the dictionary, if you still use books, management is the process of dealing with or controlling things. So when we manage our symptoms, um, we, we may be trying to control them or reduce them or cope with them in some way. And the definition of medical treatment is management again, but care to prevent, cure, ameliorate, or get rid of, or slow the progression of a medical treatment, of a medical condition, usually with some type of intervention. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that they're not necessarily the same. Not every symptom is gonna have a medication, nor should it. And uh, not every um, symptom uh, may, be as, uh, may be managed the same. So let's talk about management and treatment options. And I'm just gonna go through, we'll start with myotonia. So myotonia is the difficulty releasing a muscle after contracting it. And it, it can be worse in the cold. So keeping warm helps. Gloves, mittens, sweaters, those kind of things can really help. And also, you can reduce myotonia by repeating the movements. So there's some fatigability of it. So if you open and close your hand multiple times before you do something, you get less and less myotonia. Um, for people who have to give talks, sometimes they feel like the myotonia of their jaw can be difficult can be a problem, and especially if you have to talk in front of a group like this, even though I'm just talking to a computer, I'm a little bit nervous, and maybe I'm clenching my muscles a little bit more, it may be more difficult to relax those. So repeating sort of um, contracting the muscle before you have to speak can sometimes help prevent that where your tongue is stuck or your jaw feels like it's stuck or, or you're slurring your speech. There are medications that can help Myotonia, mexilatine is the most uh, thoroughly studied and most commonly used. And there's other medications though that can work. Not everybody can tolerate mexilatine or it doesn't work so well for them. And you have other choices. There's phenytoin, there's acetazolamide, there's a whole list of drugs, resagiline, um, amitriptyline. 
And some people have asked, some of my patients have asked about using cannabinoids. Well, that helps, so CBD oil. Um, for, there's no studies, but for some people that does seem to work. So I can't endorse it, but I can say that anecdotally, some people say it does help. So what about muscle weakness? What can we do to help the muscle weakness? Well, at this point in time, we don't really have a medical treatment for this, but you can get orthotics for um, foot drop. You can get, see an occupational therapist. There's so many tools that you, you can use to help bypass your weakness, to make your life easier. And then regular exercise to maintain what you have, don't lose what you've got, and then energy conservation. And now you're saying, wait a minute, you just said regular exercise and energy conservation, one right after the other. That does not make any sense. Well, the issue is that you can conserve your energy while doing some exercise by using orthotics and braces or um, having tools that help you bypass some of the weakness. Speaking of exercise, muscle pain. What helps muscle pain? This is, pain can sometimes be one of the biggest complaints that people have when, when they have myotonic dystrophy, muscle pain can be a real problem. Exercise helps to reduce some of that pain. My, um, there are medications, some of the myotonic um, medications, so like mexilatine can sometimes help, and some of the other ones that I talked about earlier can sometimes help. And then other medications or treatments that are used for fibromyalgia. So what is the most common treatment for fibromyalgia, which is a disorder that causes diffuse muscle pain? Exercise. And also other medications like duloxetine, which is an antidepressant, but also works to help reduce pain or gabapentin or um, again, CBD oil. Some patients really feel like um, the cannabinoids can be helpful. Fatigue. Fatigue can be for a variety of reasons, could just be from the disease. It is difficult for us to know exactly what causes fatigue, but important things to look for that could be corrected would be a, rest, a decrease in your respiratory function. So you should have, if you've had a sudden increase in fatigue, you should make sure that someone assesses your breathing. So uh, you may have had a forced vital capacity check, which is where you blow into a tube and they see how much pressure you can, uh, you can uh, develop. And that should be done both sitting and lying down. And you should get your thyroid checked. You should be getting it checked yearly anyway. Low thyroid can make you feel more fatigued. High thyroid can make you feel more fatigued. And you should get your glucose checked. If you um, listen to Dr. Green's talk, she talked about um, insulin resistance, and um, that is a problem in people with myotonic dystrophy. So getting your glucose checked is important uh, to make sure that you're not developing diabetes. High glucose can be a real problem causing fatigue. And then if you're male, having your testosterone checked because low testosterone levels can uh, do occur in, in males with myotonic dystrophy and can get worse with aging even if you don't have myotonic dystrophy. So that's important to check as well. Energy conservation, again, as we talked about already, and then get screened for a sleep disorder, for sleep apnea. So if you have sleep apnea at night, you're gonna be more fatigued during the day. So what's the biggest issue with sleep apnea? People don't like to wear the device. They don't wanna wear the mask. So find a mask that's comfortable and fits. The machines now are so much better than they used to be. The masks are better. There's continually all sorts of different ways to find masks that help you. If, if you don't, if you don't find what you you uh, need at one place, then you may be you may want to look into whether or not you have to. You can find someone else who can fit you with a mask better. And the other thing is there may be some difficulty putting it on. So if you have some hand weakness. Sometimes people don't like to wear it because if they have to get up at night, then it's hard for them to get the mask off. Sometimes the occupational therapists can work with you and make changes to your mask fitting. And, um, and, and uh, this can be really helpful for people. Velcro straps, different things that make it a little bit easier to at least take it off so you can get up, go to the bathroom, whatever you need to do in the middle of the night. And then again, 
regular exercise can, even though it may seem counterintuitive, it can help fatigue as well. Now, we talked before about um, cannabinoids, marijuana, CBD. Just remember that that can be counterproductive and may increase your fatigue as well as, uh, as apathy, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But your other medications may also be playing a role. So make sure your doctor goes through your medications if you've had a change in your fatigue level. So that's my smile about regular exercise. <laughs> what about sleepiness and drowsiness, which may be completely different than the fatigue. So the fatigue is one, is, is, doesn't, it's, is associated with the drowsiness or sleepiness, but it could be completely unassociated. So other things that should be checked for are, besides getting a sleep study done uh, to look for sleep apnea, would be to look for narcolepsy, which is a, another sleep disorder that can occur in people with myotonic dystrophy and uh, should be considered, has a completely different treatment than sleep apnea. Now, um, there are medical treatments that people use, modafinil um, and similar medications to that which can sometimes help with uh, sleepiness and, or drowsiness. And um, there are lot, there's lots of interest in trying to find um, other treatments for this in the future. So as long as we're talking about um, getting uh, checked for sleep apnea, let's talk about shortness of breath. So shortness of breath can occur because your respiratory muscles are weaker. And so you should, again, get an assessment of your breathing, both sitting and lying down. And this should, this should be done once a year at least, but if you've had a change, you should be getting it checked again. You need to see a pulmonologist, a lung doctor, if you are having some uh, new shortness of breath as well. There's the multidisciplinary approach because you also may need further cardiac screening. So be, this is beyond your yearly EKG. You, uh, sometimes people can develop um, uh, a, some heart failure associated with um, the disease, on, not as commonly, but it can sometimes happen. And if you've developed new shortness of breath, it's something else to look for. Remember, be careful with oxygen. Don't just have your doctor put you on oxygen. Too much oxygen in people who have myotonic dystrophy can be a problem. It can um, actually reduce your breathing uh, because of uh, your, your decreased response to um, higher levels, your decreased, because of uh, higher levels of oxygen can actually decrease your respiratory drive due to the fact that if you are having respiratory muscle weakness, you may be um, more like a patient who has COPD if you, if, uh, where higher doses of oxygen can be trouble. So don't just go and ask for oxygen. Make sure that you're seeing a pulmonologist and that the pulmonologist understands uh, that you have myotonic dystrophy and about your disease. So what about vision changes? You can have vision changes. You should be getting a yearly eye exam. Uh, cataracts uh, develop commonly. Sometimes they're the only symptom in patients with myotonic dystrophy, uh, may be the only symptom that they have. When you look back in your family, that may be the only symptom that carries through, uh, but cataracts should be screened for. Sometimes you get vision changes because your eyelids are drooping. So you start to get um, what's called ptosis, spelled with the silent P, just like why you can't hear a pterodactyl in the bathroom, right? Sorry, the P is silent. That's my favorite joke ever. Um, anyway, so you get uh, eyelid drooping and that can be treated non-surgically or surgically. So you can treat it with what's called eyelid crutches and also a surgical treatment to lift your eyelids. So when I first heard the terms eyelid crutches, I don't know what I thought. I was thinking about when I was uh, in training, I was thinking like they're these little crutches, you know, that you put in your eye. Well, it turns out that's not what they are. You put them on glasses and then they fit here and they pull your eyelids up when you have your glasses on. And that's uh, very helpful. I kind of like the idea of little tiny crutches in there, but. But you should see an ophthalmologist and see what your options are. Um, 
dry eyes can also occur due to the difficulty with completely closing your eyes. Sometimes people have enough facial weakness that they can't close their eyes well at night. And you can just use saline eye drops that can be helpful if you get dry eyes during the day. Sometimes people will use them every couple of hours. They just put a couple in if you can't tolerate um, saline eye drops. You should again talk to your ophthalmologist. There's other things that can be done both non-surgically and um, surgically, but uh, in including ointments at night or um, patching, just I would uh, advise you to see an ophthalmologist. Now, I'm no ophthalmologist, but th that's my advice. Speech problems. So speech problems can occur. Uh, many of you uh, are aware of this and Probably the most common one is sort of a slurring of speech or mumbling of speech. I talked earlier about how in myotonia can play a role in it, or also softness of speech. One thing that happens is people often don't realize so much that they're mumbling and then they're talking quickly. People don't understand them. It, it, becomes, um, it becomes a point of frustration for the person with myotonic dystrophy as well as the person who's listening to the person with myotonic dystrophy. So you can see a speech therapist. They can do training, sort of uh, make you aware of what you're doing and sort of help you practice uh, more. They can provide you with some devices. So microphones can be helpful, um, adjustments to uh, different things that you can do if you're talking on the phone. There are touch screens that can help with, with voice activation for times that you really want to be clear and then working on slowing down or positioning so that you can push the air out better to give yourself better volume. And then patience, right? Just try to slow down. Don't try to get everything out as quickly as possible. And the, and the patience part includes you as well as the people that you're speaking with. It's frustrating sometimes. Um, you need to work together. Uh, to, to work around this problem. And then sometimes people talk about difficulty finding words, and we'll address this again a little bit later, but it, unfortunately, probably the best treatment for this is just, again, patience on both sides. Swallowing problems can be very worrisome. People can feel like they're choking, they can't get their food down, Key things a speech or speech therapist is going to tell you is slow down, smaller bites, change the consistency of your food, use more gravies, um, sauces, just things that will make it easier for the food to to uh, slide down essentially. Um, and the speech therapist may recommend that you have a swallow study so you can get what's a swallow study where they can actually see what happens what from the time the food enters your lips goes to the back of your throat and then slides down to your stomach and you can see where the biggest problem is is it that you're not chewing your food enough or is that it's going down the wrong tube uh, you just can't get it back there. And so the speech therapist can then actually use that video of you swallowing as part of your therapy. If swallowing becomes a big enough problem that it causes significant weight loss, working with a nutritionist or a dietitian to review your foods and how to get the most protein in so that you can stop that weight loss to work on that, it may be that you have to, maybe that you're um, fatiguing too much, so you eat some and then you just quit because it's tiring to eat um, and being so careful and slowing down and taking smaller bites and everybody around you is done and you're sitting there going, well, I still have a full plate, but you know, now we're gonna go play Monopoly and I wanna play Monopoly and I don't wanna play, I don't wanna sit here and finish my food. Um, so there's ways to make sure that you get the nutrition that you need during the day. If that's not possible, sometimes a feeding tube or gastrostomy tube uh, may be necessary. And it's important to talk to your doctor about that um, as a possibility. 
having a tube like that doesn't mean you can't continue to eat by mouth and no one really needs to see it. It can be under your shirt, you don't have to see it, but um, it allows you to get the nutrition in without the work of having to chew and swallow. Stomach and gut issues. So GI symptoms are, can be one of the most troublesome things that uh, people with myotonic dystrophy suffer with. Sometimes it's reflux or stomach pains or reflux heartburn. So try to avoid foods that trigger this. Uh, if you can't identify them, sometimes again, a dietitian can be helpful in helping you identify this. Don't eat right before going to bed. And then if you have continued to have um, stomach pain, remember that there's an increased uh, incidence of uh, gallstones or um, gallbladder problems that can occur in people with myotonic dystrophy. And it's important to get screened for that um, as you may need to have your gallbladder taken out. Um, there are also standard medications. Again, work with your doctor on this if it's a, uh, a problem. Don't ignore it uh, because especially if it's a gallbladder problem, you don't wanna wait until it's an emergency to take care of it. Constipation and or diarrhea. So can be constipation, can be diarrhea, can go back and forth. Both very uncomfortable and troublesome. Sometimes um, irritable bowel syndrome can be so severe that you don't want to leave the house. So there's medications that can help with that. Um, but if it's a, a major problem, you need to see a gastroenterologist, but that person really needs to understand that you have myotonic dystrophy um, and that this is um, a common problem that can occur. Sometimes it's simple, quote unquote, it's bacterial overgrowth. You can treat that um, with some different treatments. Sometimes um, you, it's just setting up sort of a regular regimen for your bowel. So just saying that if you don't have a bowel movement in so many days, then you're gonna use an over-the-counter treatment, but you need to work out some type of regimen with your uh, doctor to make sure that you're uh, not overusing the medications and definitely laxatives are not a good idea, but drugs that, are, that help to bulk, so fiber uh, drugs can be helpful. There's um, regular exercise. Oh, did I say exercise again? Yes, <laughs> regular exercise can help with constipation. Uh, and so that's important. And then there are different devices that you can use to help. So what do I mean by devices? That sounds really odd, but there's this thing called the Squatty Potty that I learned about actually at my first MDF meeting ever. Um, and uh, it can be very helpful because it allows you to more comfortably um, uh, sort of position yourself so that you can empty your bowel. Other symptoms, lack of motivation or apathy uh, can be a problem in patients with myotonic dystrophy. So this is a part of the disease that um, we are understanding more and more about at this point. So changes occur in the brain that may cause these, uh, this to occur. So what, what can you do to help counter um, this lack of motivation? Well, you can schedule events. Now we schedule Zoom meetings. It used to be you would meet somebody for coffee. Now you meet them on Zoom. Or you can get a dog. One of my patients got a dog to walk twice a day, got her out of the house, walking the dog, exercise. Did I say exercise again? <laughs> she really uh, found that to be a good way to get her up and about. This lack of motivation is often more of a concern for other people than the person who has myotonic dystrophy. And how much of an issue it is depends on what you, you want to accomplish um, during your day and also if you're making sure that you're staying healthy. People talk a lot about mood disorders, anxiety, and depression in myotonic dystrophy. In 
the more recent studies that have been done, uh, depression is probably not any more common than it is in the, um, in the population of people who don't have myotonic dystrophy. But it can occur and it's important to address it. Anxiety, the same, maybe a slightly more increased um, occurrence of anxiety in people with myotonic dystrophy than those who don't. But regardless, not to be ignored, not to just say, oh, well, you know, you have myotonic dystrophy, that's what happens. Uh, counseling can be very helpful and medications may be needed and you should not um, hesitate to discuss this with your doctor. Just remember to screen for the side effects of some of these medications, which can cause some of the, or increase some of the symptoms that we've already talked about. So lastly, thinking or cognitive changes. These are difficult at this point, no real treatment options, but you can manage them. You can write, learn to, write or make lists. There are computer tools that can be helpful to you to help you work with this and just have patience both with yourself and for the person who is your caregiver or your friends or your family also to have patience with you. And sometimes people will see a neuropsychologist to work on different techniques, different mechanisms to use, because for every person, it may be a little bit different um, when this happens as to how you're gonna deal with it. So there's hope for the future though. Medical treatment, as I said, is the management and care to prevent, cure, ameliorate, to get rid of, or slow the progression of a medical condition. And this is a very hopeful time for myotonic dystrophy. Um, and as far as finding treatments or cures that will um, change the course of this disease. So these are the symptoms that we talked about more or less just now. And I just wanna remind you that when it comes to your symptoms, educate yourself and educate your care team. And I'd like to also just remind you that My Tonic Dystrophy Foundation has these great tools. They're really great. You can share them with your doctor. You can just share the website with them. Any, and it's for all different types of myotonic dystrophy. This is a wonderful accomplishment. I don't think I see this in any other diseases that I take care of. This was developed with experts from all over the world, and it's really quite impressive. So make sure that you give this website to your doctors, let them look up the toolkits, they're very useful, and there's tools in there for you as well. So remember, always pass on what you have learned. Hopefully you've learned some today. I'm learning all the time, and I try to pass it on. May the force be with you, and thank you. Do we have any questions? So far, no. Okay, either it was clear or it was clear as mud. Do I think exercise is a good idea? Is somebody tweaking me here? I would say, yes, I do. I think exercise is a good idea, but it depends on your, <clears throat> your particular physical condition. So before you embark on exercise, you should talk to your doctor about it. Sometimes a physical therapist can help you develop an exercise program that is safe and good for you. Um, but uh, I think it's important. So there's not really, so the next question is any brain teasers or games to keep our mental ability sharp? There's most of the studies that really look at these uh, brain teasers or games don't show that they can 
improve things, but anytime that you're engaging your brain, so crossword puzzles, um, uh, you know, other brain teasers and games that really force you to sort of stay agile in your brain. So exercise your brain. Oh God, have I said exercise enough? Um, so that, that, that can be helpful. Um, playing games with other people also helps with interactions. Uh, it keeps you, um, helps your mood. Uh, so I think that's a good idea. Well, thank you. And um, Leslie added that for exercise tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, there's a DM strength training class at the conference. So I'm not the only one who's preaching about that. So what do I recommend for pain management other than exercise? There are different medications and that can be helpful for pain management. Um, some people find that heat or different ointments can be helpful. Um, I have a patient who believes in um, the use of this eucalyptus or any kind of cooling gel that just kind of helps to reduce pain. Um, I think it's worth considering. Um, I said I mentioned uh, CBD oil. Some people really feel that makes a difference for their pain, and I am not promoting that, uh, but it is an option. Um, and um, and yeah, and heat uh, heat can be very helpful. Leslie added that in there. So, what kind of exercise is best? What if there's a mobility if mobility is an issue? Usually non, um, what is the word I'm looking for, uh, non-pounding exercise. I, I can't think of what the, yeah, so usually exercise that is um, not, uh, so things like bicycling or you can do, um, an, there are arm bicycles. You really want to also kind of keep yourself aerobically um, healthy in general. So, um, doing exercise for five minutes a day and then slowly increasing it over time. You can do, um, some people like to use resistance bands. We often encourage people not to do like heavy weight lifting for a variety of reasons. One being that if you have some hand weakness and you're lifting weights and you drop it, you can hurt yourself, right? So that's one of the things to consider. Did I say there are computer tools for cognitive stuff? No, I didn't say that. I don't think I said that. I think that we were talking about computer games. I'm not sure. Um, right, and Leslie points out that there's a lot of adaptive accessible online exercise classes, especially now. I mean, if you have to think about one good thing about COVID is that so many things are available online that were not available before. Can low dose naltrexone be helpful for pain or other symptoms? I don't have any um, significant uh, experience with that. And so I don't feel um, like I can speak to that. Can hiccups be a symptom? Hiccups can be a symptom. And actually sometimes the, um, some people get recurrent hiccups, and uh, it could be because of gas. So one of the things that I didn't talk about with swallowing, sometimes people will, if, you, if it's a lot of work to swallow, you have to use a bolus of air to sort of push the food down or to get it pat through. And so then sometimes people get bloated and they may have a feeling that they need to belch or they get hiccups. Um, and you can sometimes treat that with medications if it becomes a problem um, rather than just having people scare you all the time. So if a parent finds out they have DM, is there any benefit in having their young children genetically tested to see they have it too, or should they just wait? That's a question that's um, a bit outside of this, con about this session. Um, I'm happy to address that. I think the though um, the best thing to do is to talk to a genetic counselor or your neurologist um, to have them discuss. There's not, it depends on if, the, if your child has symptoms, 
And some people feel very strongly that you should get them tested, some feel the other way. So it's uh, important to have a discussion about why, what are the pros and cons of getting your child tested. So how would you exercise muscles that aren't in the main muscle groups? Facial muscles when there's weakness there. That's a hard one. Um, that is oftentimes not something that you're gonna be able to overcome. I don't have a good answer to that one. Are there any tools to measure which exercises are working well for you that are easy to afford and use at home, given everyone's body responds differently? Um, I think that one of the helpful tools would be a one-time visit with a physical therapist, not necessarily, it may, more than just like a trainer, uh, but an actual physical therapist who can help you uh, determine what exercises are gonna be safe for you and helpful. Um, and one of the measures is gonna be how you feel. Do you feel less fatigued? Do you feel like you can do a little bit more? Have I heard of Lamotrigine being used for myotonia? Yes. So we, we use a lot of things. One of the things that we try to do is block the muscle channels. So this is another drug that can block the channels in the muscles to reduce excitability in the muscles that have that make the continuous firing that causes um, the difficulty opening. Does myotonia contribute to pain and alleviating myotonia also relieve pain? It's felt that myotonia does contribute to the pain and that may be why the myotonia medications help. Right, so the next question is, I have sleep apnea and I've heard that a BiPAP is more effective than CPAP. So people with respiratory muscle weakness often do better with BiPAP than CPAP. That's a reason to see a, uh, to, that, the, to take your guidelines, your pulmonary guidelines with you to see the pulmonologist or the sleep doctor who's gonna be the one who um, writes you the prescription for your uh, for your sleep apnea machine. There's actually all sorts of different machines out there now, even beyond BiPAP. It starts to get over my head and I don't really understand exactly um, the how they work, but they can do variable pressure and there's different things so that you don't feel so much like everything's blowing in. I mean, one of the issues for people with myotonic dystrophy for some people is that they ha you have facial muscle weakness, right? So so if air is blowing in, it makes your face kind of puff out because you, you, you can't keep a good seal. So there's lots of different, that's why it may be more uncomfortable if you 10 years ago had been given CPAP or BiPAP, you said, forget this, this really is awful. I just, it's, it's horrible to have this blowing in my face. There are so many different masks, so many different ways to do this now than there used to be. I think that wraps it up. Good. Thank you all very, very much.